Good morning for those of you uh, logging in from the United States and welcome to everyone uh, uh, watching from around the world. Um, my name is Tarun Chabra. I'm a fellow with the Foreign Policy Program uh, at the Brookings Institution and also with the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. I'm uh, delighted to welcome everyone to today's uh, second panel of our webinar, uh, part of our Global China Project. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about um, a series of papers that uh, we've just published uh, on China's uh, technological reach around the world. Um, uh, following a terrific panel this morning, uh, moderated by my colleague Chris Meserol, uh, where the focus was on a number of particular technologies, uh, as well as the idea of uh, global technological infrastructure uh, and what China's ambitions and achievements have been to date in that. Uh, in the second panel, we're really going to focus on how this translates into U.S.-China competition, and we'll look at it from two directions. Uh, we'll be looking at it in terms of how developments in technology themselves will shape or are already shaping U.S.-China technology competition, but also the ways in which uh, other dimensions of U.S.-China competition are shaping technology and its development uh, themselves. So we have a really stellar panel to talk about all of this today. Um, we have um, uh, Mike Brown, who's the director of the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, we have Elsa Kenia, who is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. We have uh, Andrew Imbri, uh, my colleague at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Uh, we have Scott Moore, who's the director of the University of Pennsylvania's uh, China program with Penn Global. And uh, we have Tom Wheeler, who uh, is a visiting fellow with the uh, Governance Studies uh, Program at the Brookings Institution and the former uh, chairman of the Federal Communications uh, Commission. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And thank you for all of your contributions uh, to our Global China Project. We're very appreciative uh, of it. Um, I think to kick us off, um, I'd like to turn to you, Mike, if we may. Um, uh, you um, have written a paper with colleagues, Eric Tuning, who is the former Chief of Staff to Secretary of Defense Mattis, and Pav Singh, uh, your colleague at the Defense Innovation Unit. Um, you've written a paper uh, about a superpower marathon is the way that we ought to be thinking about US-China technology competition. Um, so I wanna ask you just a very basic question kind of at the start of this, which is, um, what is the what are the geopolitical intentions of China that are informing your view that this is really about a marathon? How should we understand those, and how do China's technology ambitions fit into uh, that picture? So over to you, Mike. Okay, uh, thanks, Tarun. Delighted to be here today. I think we can take uh, Xi basically at face value in terms of his geopolitical intentions. Uh, he's made it pretty clear. Soon after he was elevated to his current role, he made a speech, which has now been translated, that basically says uh, China's mission is not to join the world order that the U.S. created after the Second World War, but to rival the U.S. And we've all become familiar with uh, some of his terms and subsequent uh, speeches about national rejuvenation. Uh, it's a time for China to be ascendant on the world stage and Asia for Asians which in my mind means uh, he intends for China to be the hegemon for the Eastern Pacific and for Western Asia. That certainly includes territories he views as his own, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South China Sea, uh, and uh, certainly expanding beyond that with the Belt and Road Initiative. He clearly views, as does the rest of the Politburo, that science, technology, and innovation are key to uh, growing the economy, uh, China is already the second world's second largest economy, and he very much subscribes to the view that it's the strong economy which will uh, mean that China has its own national security. He's steely stated that uh, he wants China to catch up and surpass the U.S. in technology. So I think we're well beyond the time when uh, China is hiding its strength and biding its time. And I think we're in an era where he intends to make China great again meaning restore China's position that he feels they've historically held for most of the last 5,000 years as being a, a key, if not the key global power in the world of, uh, of Asia and, and the Western, Western uh, Pacific, I'm sorry, Eastern Pacific. In terms of a containment strategy, which of course we successfully used in uh, World War II, we, or after World War II and the Cold War, uh, 
it's too late for that. Uh, we began that strategy when the U.S., after the Second World War, had 75% of the world's GDP and the Soviet Union was uh, war-torn after the Second World War. So China's economic scale, uh, already being the second largest economy with ambitions to overtake us and be the first, uh, their integration in the world being the largest trading partner to dozens of countries, their desire and ability to manipulate world institutions for their own advantage, well outlined in their China Standards 2035 project, uh, a follow-on to Made in China 2025, and the fact that we don't have sufficient um, consensus among allies about what to do uh, in a global uh, China strategy among our allies means that uh, it's too late for containment. So we're not going to be successful deploying that same strategy uh, with China. So, uh, and Mike, thank you very much. So, so you, um, you with other colleagues of the Defense Innovation Unit back in 2018 wrote um, a paper about Chinese tech technology transfer strategies. Um, and you called for tighter investment restrictions, among other things, in that paper. So um, tell us, kind of how, how should we think about the balance then between defensive measures and more affirmative measures? How would you, how would you weigh that? Well, interestingly enough, uh, when we wrote that paper, uh, uh, folks jumped on the defensive part of the strategy. Uh, what can we do to strengthen CFIUS uh, export controls? And I think that's something you have to do, but you're never going to win in a technology race with defense. So uh, I don't think it should be the U.S.'s goal to thwart China's rise. Uh, our goal needs to be to make the U.S. the most productive, innovative, competitive uh, economic power in the globe and to enable our own growth. So if you think about the balance, the far more important strategy is what can we do to invest in ourselves in the U.S. Certainly that uh, investment means we need to do more basic research. Uh, that's certainly what government and academia need to do. That's been a proven strategy. That is something from the Cold War that we can take forward and use again. But I think now the more important and more difficult strategy is going to be what do we do to reform our business thinking and our capital markets to move away from short-term thinking to be more long-term oriented. So we've been on a path since the 1980s, something that's called a shareholder revolution that has increasingly gotten our focus on efficiency of capital and short-term measures. This is not the right approach for a superpower marathon with China, which takes a very long-term view and views technology and innovation as key to developing national capability as part of a national strategy. So we can see kind of the, the evidence of this over the landscape, um, the focus on quarterly earnings, uh, focus on stock price, um, shorter periods uh, for holding stock now that most stocks are held institutionally versus by individuals. CEO comp plans embody this. We have the shortest tenure we've ever had for CEOs. Activism, private equity, share buybacks, they all feed into this short-term thinking in our business community. And I saw this firsthand as a CEO of two public companies in Silicon Valley um, from the 90s through the aughts and uh, uh, the teens. This infuses all of our thinking and we have to reform this or we're not gonna be successful in competing with China. Thanks, Mike. And would you say just a little bit about some of the policy tools that you think we ought to be uh, using to address some of the short-termism? Absolutely. Well, we have to start thinking about uh, what can we do to bring institutional uh, shareholders on board with this strategy? We can't have businesses fighting with uh, their owners in this. So we need to be thinking about what are some of the longer term measures that we should be using. Um, that would certainly involve decade long measures of what are we doing to bring new capabilities as opposed to what are we doing just to increase stock price in the short term. Uh, I think we've got to think about the fact that our um, uh, economy is based on lots of uh, financial transactions and whether that really serves us for the long term. Um, the ability to uh, focus on what have we achieved in one year or three years, which is, uh, you know, what a private equity model is based on. It's how activism works. We've got to rethink that. And you could envision maybe there should be incentives for long term um, growth, long term capital appreciation, long term capability development could do with that with tax incentives and maybe some of the short-term financial transactions, uh, especially those that 
and in many cases have gutted capability, sent manufacturing uh, offshore, uh, shed hardware businesses, which now we wish we had in our supply chain here in this country. Uh, those kind of transactions, maybe there should be a penalty for that. You could you could envision that your tax policy could could uh, encourage long term investment, more R and D uh, tax credits, as an example, which have shown to be pretty elastic in research, um, and away from uh, uh, a purely financial transaction based economy. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so, so I want to turn now to uh, to Elsa um, to talk a little bit about the application of emerging technologies to uh, military uses. Um, Elsa, we hear a lot about the, the concept of civil military fusion. Um, you've written a lot about that as well. Can you tell us um, to start with what what does the People Liberations Army mean when we see writing about uh, quote unquote intelligentized warfare? Um, and what role does the PLA see for um, what, what are often called AI weapons in advancing um, its broader military objectives? And, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis, um, certain conflict scenarios with the United States. Well, that's a great question, thank you. And very glad to be joining you all this morning for the conversation. I guess I'd say to start uh, that it's become increasingly clear under Xi Jinping that as Mike just said, innovation is seen as critical to strategic competition. And I'd really trace this back to as early as 2014, around the same time the US military was starting the third offset when Chinese military leaders were looking at the notion of an emerging revolution in military affairs and the way that the character of conflict was changing with advances in emerging technologies from unmanned systems to artificial intelligence and concerned about how to keep pace with, or at least avoid falling behind the United States in this, in this intensifying competition. And this notion of intelligentization or Jirnanghua is a concept that Xi Jinping uh, has personally highlighted as an important direction for Chinese military modernization in order to adapt to the ways that the character of conflict is changing from what is described as informatized warfare to this new phase or new era perhaps of intelligentized warfare in which there's greater importance for emerging technologies on the battlefield and AI is starting to be incorporated into the system of systems uh, that enables joint operations in more and more ways going forward across every domain, across, an, across a range of applications and nearly every service of the PLA since then has started to pursue some of these applications and capabilities building upon existing programs and seeking to integrate AI into pre-existing weapon systems. So there's definitely a technological dimension of this competition in which AI is prominent and Chinese military strategists even talk about this notion of seeking to design future warfare or set the terms in which the battle will be waged by being on the forefront of emerging military technologies. And that's when Xi Jinping calls upon the PLA to be a world-class military by mid-century, being at the cutting edge of these new frontiers is a critical component of that agenda and objective going forward. And some of the more concrete manifestations of this have been AI-enabled or increasingly autonomous capabilities across a range of systems and weapon systems. And of course, the question of what exactly autonomy is or how to draw the line between a drone that might be remotely piloted relative to one that has some degree of intelligence, so to speak, can be ambiguous. But certainly there is evidence that, for instance, some of the drones that the PLA Air Force is starting to field, like the uh, GJ-2 uh, or Attack 2 a high-end drone that has some level of autonomy, including perhaps in, in operational contingencies, some of the loitering munitions that have been deployed, like the WS-43 or the H or the CH-901 also have some level of autonomy and there's incre increased uh, attention to this notion of suicide drones as potentially relevant in operational contingencies. And as we think about uh, potential conflict scenarios as a worst case scenario, certainly for instance, a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, uh, one could envision that these kinds of cutting edge capabilities could be important. For instance, uh, in a missile campaign to overwhelm Taiwan's air defenses, or even the use of unmanned and autonomous systems for uh, logistics and support of amphibious operations. So certainly those, these kind of high-end capabilities would be relevant in that kind of conflict scenario, but in an era when 
we're seeing increased attention to peacetime competition as well. I would anticipate that some of the earliest ways in which we'll see AI start to play out will be in these virtual domains, cyber operations, psychological operations, aimed at influence and beyond that. And certainly a, a, lot, a lot to try to keep track of as this progresses, but uh, we'll, this will, I think, will continue to be an important element of this competition. Thanks, Elson. How, I mean, how would you assess the, the PLA's progress to date in, in, in developing and adopting some of these technologies? Um, obviously, the, the PLA doesn't have the same recent um, uh, battlefield experience. So um, how, how do they overcome that, um, both in terms of thinking about training data uh, and, and adapting these technologies to TTPs and so on? This process of military innovation will be inherently challenge, challenging for the, for the PLA, given some aspects of its culture, the ongoing reforms that continue to be quite disruptive, and as you mentioned, this lack of recent operational experience. And Chinese military leaders uh, recognize that. They're concerned about this lack of experience in combat and concerned about how the PLA would actually perform in that kind of contingency. So there's a focus on a uh, very realistic, what's described as actual combat training, as well as what I'd describe as attempts to learn without fighting. So wargaming, military sim simulations that inform theoretical research and exploration of some of these concepts and theories. And the process of learning and experimentation, starting to bring together strategists and technologists, this notion of trying to integrate expertise in military theory with expertise in military technology, such as the initiatives underway at the Academy of Military Science. So certainly there will be critical challenges ahead, especially when it comes to data, some of the same bureaucratic impediments the US military has faced in terms of having the underlying infrastructure as well as the training data to start to develop and implement these systems as well as testing and reliability as there's greater progress in deployment, but there's certainly relative to other elements of military competition, the US and China are starting from closer to the same point here. The US may have a slight advantage on some fronts, but for some of these challenges, there's certainly uh, the US military and the PLA are, are grappling with, uh, with these issues in parallel. Thanks, Elsa. Um, so I want to turn from artificial intelligence now to the life sciences um, and, and ask you a question, Scott, because I think whereas there's a lot of policy focus on AI right now, I think a lot of technologists will tell you um, looking ahead, there'll probably be um, as much, if not more, on biotechnology going forward. And, and Scott, you've written a great paper for us as well um, on China's ambitions and progress to date um, in biotech. So um, please, if you would just kind of frame for us China's biotech ambitions writ large. Um, and also if you would, you know, because there's there's so much concern about different norms and how, how biotech would um, unfold uh, in, in China, give us both the dystopian picture and then give us potentially a more hopeful scenario about about how we how this unfolds over the the next couple of decades, and and which you think you think we're more likely to see. Thanks, Tarun, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's certainly a little easier to paint a dystopian than uh, a hopeful or optimistic picture, but I'll, I'll certainly do my best. Um, before I, I get to that, though, I really want to thank uh, Tarun, uh, you again, and then uh, as well as Brookings and CSET for uh, this project and for convening us this morning. Uh, it's a really uh, exciting and interesting and important set of issues. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about biotech, it's, it's helpful to just kind of begin with um, a thumbnail sketch of, of the history of, of science and technology. Um, and with apologies to actual historians uh, of science, I think if you were to try to reduce um, that to a soundbite, uh, it might go something like this, um, that in the 19th century, a lot of the really important advances um, that we made uh, came from mastering chemistry. So things like artificial fertilizer that really, you know, we, we take pretty much for granted now, but, but really made modern life and modern society possible. Uh, as we move into the 20th century, uh, mastering physics allowed us to uh, develop nuclear energy as well as, uh, of course, nuclear weapons. And then as we look uh, into this century, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that the really revolutionary transformational advances in science and technology are gonna come from uh, biology. Um, so that's, I think, really at a very kind of big picture level, 
um, why uh, it matters and why you see a lot of increasing interest in the sector from governments as well as from the private sector uh, and from researchers. Uh, the other important thing to know uh, about biotech kind of from a global perspective is that the US has really been the dominant player uh, in most parts of the sector pretty much throughout the post-war period. Um, I think particularly from sort of roughly the late 60s into the early 2000s, um, it really approached kind of near hegemony. Um, there were really very few areas of the biotech sector where um, you didn't see uh, US companies and universities and research institutions really kind of playing um, the leading role. But as we got into um, this century and it became more and more apparent uh, what advances in areas like synthetic biology could potentially mean um, for transforming the sector, a lot of different countries have started developing plans and policies and strategies uh, to try to boost uh, their own uh, domestic biotech sectors and industries. Um, of those, though, China is really the only one whose scale could potentially kind of pose a threat to American preeminence um, in the biotech sector. And just to give you uh, one sense of that, one of the sort of headline um, policy targets for China in the biotech sector um, is for biotechnology to uh, account for roughly 4% uh, of China's GDP actually by, by this year. Uh, and in comparison in the US, it makes up um, roughly half of that around 2% of GDP. Um, the pandemic has obviously uh, completely kind of uh, skewed uh, GDP figures, uh, but that just gives you some sense of kind of the level of ambition and relative um, uh, relative aspiration uh, for development of the biotech sector in China versus um, the US. Um, so that's where from an economic and kind of military competitiveness point of view, you're seeing a lot more concern um, for developments in this sector from the US and other, other Western countries. Um, the ironic thing though about this kind of competitive framing um, is that uh, there are probably few areas or sectors um, where there are stronger um, reasons in principle um, why you wouldn't want bilateral, multilateral, and international cooperation. Um, so if you think about things like uh, strengthening biosafety, uh, preventing synthetic bioterrorism, which I think is one of the most concerning things we're gonna have to start thinking about um, in, this, uh, in this century, and of course some people uh, have already, uh, vaccine development. These are all areas where there's a really strong uh, kind of public good or quasi public good aspect and therefore really strong uh, rationale in principle for, uh, for cooperation. Uh, in practice though, uh, as we all know, um, both from kind of a policy and a, a politics perspective, um, things are really kind of driving more, uh, more towards divergence. Um, whether it's uh, uh, regulations or laws in China, which uh, are some of the most restrictive in the world when it comes to biomedical data sharing. And in fact, they're so um, uh, stringent that uh, I guess it was two years ago, uh, the government forced uh, uh, Beida, Peking University, to shut down a long running collaboration with Oxford, uh, apparently in, in breach of some of these regulations. So it's really had a uh, profound, I think, kind of chilling effect on, um, on international collaboration in biotech um, or things like, um, you know, there have been for years growing signs and fears uh, that biotech has been a major focus of um, uh, IP theft uh, and uh, non-traditional intelligence collection uh, on the part of Chinese actors. So there are a lot of, you know, and then obviously uh, in the pandemic era, all of the kind of political uh, uh, contention over uh, the source of the pandemic and everything, uh, all of those things are heading very much in the wrong direction in terms of cooperation. And so uh, I think although there's this strong kind of um, principled reason why we should want cooperation, and that's what I would characterize as the optimistic um, case, I think the realistic uh, case and, and scenario is just continuing down the path that we're on, which is to see biotech primarily in terms of kind of zero sum national competition. Um, I think that's going to be quite harmful for innovation, um, although I think it probably does favor the U.S., at least in the short term, because uh, in most parts of the sector, uh, U.S. companies and institutions do, I think, uh, maintain an edge uh, over competitors elsewhere, particularly in China. Um, what I really think will suffer is uh, cooperation on public goods, um, which you know, I'd argue we need more than ever as we continue to wrestle to try to control this pandemic and uh, confront uh, things like climate change as well. Uh, so uh, I just say, I think, you know, there is an optimistic uh, scenario, but I, I think unfortunately it's not uh, the most realistic one on current trends.
All right, thank you, Scott. We might press you more on the dystopian scenario a little more later in the, the Q&A. Um, I, I, um, the strategic picture, Elsa and Scott, you've uh, talked about um, particular technologies. Um, we've talked a little bit about investment and long-term investment and policy reforms to facilitate that. Um, one of the papers in this series um, addresses immigration policy. Um, but there are also uh, regulatory and policy levers, including competition policy, um, which Tom Wheeler has written about for us. And then there's alliance policy as well, which Andrew has written about. So if, if we could, I'd like to turn to you, Andrew, next to talk about, in general, what you think we should be doing with our allies to address this kind of broad range of challenges from China uh, on technology, um, but also to say uh, in particular, we should be doing on challenges, which was the focus of your, our Georgetown colleague, um, Ryan Fidashuk. So well, thank you so much, Tarun. And I just want to echo Scott's thanks to all the panelists, uh, to General Allen, Jason Matheny, and everybody else who's participated today. I've learned a great deal. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. So when I wrestle with this question, I've, I found myself turning to a paper that the former director of the Office of Net Assessment, the late Andrew Marshall wrote in the early 70s, uh, where he really sort of developed the early views about competitive strategies. And I think there's some lessons that we can apply to our alliance strategies today. He noticed back then that we were in a long-term strategic arms competition with the Soviet Union, that that competition was poorly specified, but could be shaped in ways that would be favorable to enduring US strengths. And so therefore the US should assess the balance of strategic forces, clarify its goals, uh, and then match its strengths to the relative weaknesses of the Soviet Union. Now, of course, US-China relations today are different and in some respects far more complex uh, than US-Soviet relations were during the Cold War, notably in the levels of economic interdependence and the role of a host of emerging technologies that we've been talking about today. And, and as other panelists have noted, uh, there is a delicate mix between competition and cooperation that we need to strike, a delicate sequence that needs to happen, so that calls for nuanced strategies. And I think some of Marshall's insights can be applicable here. I just mentioned three that would apply to our alliance strategy. The first is that America's broad network of alliances and partners isn't just a strategic advantage, it's an asymmetric advantage. Uh, and so instead of competing dollar for dollar or missile for missile, uh, we can really have an opportunity to leverage this alliance network to shape the environment into which China rises. Uh, the second would be that we need to adapt our alliances if they're going to succeed, and we need to adapt them in ways uh, to respond to emerging threats below the military threshold, and particularly areas where China and Russia have tried to apply wedge strategies uh, to sow division, to undermine the credibility of our commitments. Amir Rap Hooper and others have done some really interesting research on this. I think one lesson from Andrew Marshall's work is that we need to be thinking about the kinds of nuanced net assessments that will allow us to identify anomalies and patterns in the spending choices and in the strategic choices of China, uh, and then to figure out how we can match up our relative strengths to their weaknesses. And in the technology particular, I think this is clearly going to be an area where it's central to economic power and therefore to long-term military power. Uh, and one of the areas that I think we really need to focus our alliances on is agile technology alliances in discrete areas. I think some of the surprising results uh, that I found in my research is I thought we would start with a core group of allies and cooperation would radiate out from there. But what I found is that a sort of team of teams or a system of systems approach is more effective where depending on the technology, whether it's biotech, cyber, uh, mobile network platforms, uh, AI, it's going to you're going to want to work with a different cluster of partners, depending on the technology and your strategic objectives. So on the matter of AI, you know, the focus of my paper with Ryan Fedashek in the Global China series was specifically on how to defend against the transfer of sensitive technical information. And what we found, if you look at any of the pathways by which China seeks to acquire this information, whether it's through strategic acquisitions, uh, through PhD scholarships, uh, or through technology entrepreneurship competitions, and it's multifaceted, uh, you, the United States has to work with allies because it's, it's only one of the targets. Uh, if you take something like uh, strategic acquisitions and investment, 
uh, you know, more than a half of China's uh, tech-related investments go to U.S. allies and partners. Uh, if you look at its uh, scholarship programs, again, uh, the U.S. only accounts for about a third uh, of that. And so U.S. allies and partners really are a, a strategic tool. We're already doing a lot across the government, but what's needed is to bring a lot of these initiatives together in a strategic approach that will allow us to really leverage this unique and asymmetric advantage. Thank you, Andrew. And if you could just say briefly, you know, what, what is the, what's the architecture that we need to do that? I mean, is that something that should be coming out of the State Department, the Defense Department, all of the above? And, and what are the fora for cooperation where we should be doing this? Um, it, particularly if, if, as you suggest, we need to kind of be engaged in kind of ad hoc cooperation depending on the area. Thanks, Jaren. I, I would say a couple of things. One is that we need more coordination without more centralization per se. So we need to have a strategic approach, but each of the different agencies can play a critical role. So if you're talking about uh, more R&D collaborations, obviously, you know, NSF, uh, the Departments of, of Energy, uh, DARPA play a critical role. If you're talking about norms and standards, NIST, Commerce, State, they're also uh, incredibly effective. Uh, same on the defense side. You know, there are going to be different players on the U.S. side, but we need more coordination. Internationally, I think the key is to really think about optimal fora as well as optimal allies. So if you're going to focus on data sharing, uh, projects with privacy preserving machine learning, uh, or more on human capital development, you're going to want to think about which multilateral fora is the most effective and where the critical mass is, where U.S. allies and partners' interests match U.S. interests. Uh, and so a lot of this will depend on sort of nuanced approaches depending on the area. Uh, and this will require, uh, you know, sort of careful net assessments about where our interests lie and how they match up. Great. Thank you, Andrew. So let's turn now to another kind of policy regulatory lever, and that's um, domestic competition policy. We've been talking a lot about U.S.-China competition, but Tom, you've um, written a paper on domestic competition policy and why that's going to be critical for competing with China. And just to back up a little bit for, for, for our audience here, um, I think if you ask a lot of people who are, who, are, who are with us on this right now, they would say, wait, I thought, I thought that Google didn't want to work with the U.S. government or other big tech tech companies didn't want to work particularly with the U.S. military, uh, but you, you, you make the point in your paper that we've seen a shift there and you see a number of leading executives from uh, large tech companies in the United States say, you need us, uh, you need us as national champions. Um, so tell us um, where is that coming from and um, what, what, what should we be doing about it? Well, thanks Tarun and, um, and the Brookings CSET uh, project here is a, is a great idea and it's an honor to be on with this distinguished panel. Um, I think that my point here is really a bookend to what Mike Brown was talking about because he kind of pointed out the irony that U.S. companies focus on profits, often driven by market dominance, um, ends up aiding China's cause. And, and what I look at is, you, you know, you look at the wondrous products that these new companies that started in garages or dorm rooms have brought us, but they're now economic superpowers. And they are using that power to shut down competition, to expand their market control, and as a result, to shut off competition-driven innovation. All the while that they are building facilities and working to cooperate in, in China. And so my concern and what my paper is about is that the absence of a pro-competitive public policy orientation in this country actually advantages China. That market control, market dominance that we've seen from the principal big tech companies thwarts competition driven innovation. You know, I used to sit there and listen to these companies tell me about how, how regulation thwarts innovation. And it's 
not without a degree of validity, but basically what it says is, let us make the rules. Let us make the rules to advantage ourselves. And as that began to become exposed for the self-serving purposes it is, there's a pivot that's taken place to play the China card, to say, oh, regulation will hurt our ability to compete with China. But the opposite is what is true, that we need competition-driven innovation at home so that we're not putting our eggs all in one basket, so that we can let a thousand innovative flowers bloom. And the point that Mike makes in his paper is particularly appropriate here because he talks about the fiduciary responsibility that big tech companies have. And that means that innovation that is under corporate control <clears throat> is innovation that is done for corporate benefit. And what we need to do is to have innovation that moves mountains rather than innovation that moves markets. And we need, and, and to get there, we need to define exactly what our challenge is. And it is doubtful that we will be able to out implement China. They're a command economy. We've heard throughout the morning about how their data is much richer than ours, but we can out innovate China if we have policies that will encourage this competition driven innovation. So my concern is that the don't regulate us theme of big tech is actually anti-American in terms of its impact because it thwarts the very innovation that we need to be able to take on China. And so instead of following China and anointing some some national champions. What we need to be doing is acting like America and embracing good old fashioned American competition driven innovation and having policies that do that. Thanks, Tom. You really focus on, on, on the role of data in your paper. So tell us a little bit right. about why, why that's so central. Well, the, um, the capital asset of the 21st century is data. It's information. You know, the capital asset of the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, were hard assets like coal or iron or uh, other raw materials. But now um, our economy is built on the use of data. And the fascinating thing is that that data is very different from 20th century assets. It, you know, it is it, it, when you when you burned a piece of coal, it was done for. Data is inexhaustible. You create a new user to Facebook, you just use the same data you used before. That data is also iterative in that when you use data to create a product, you create new data. And that can be used to either improve or create new products. And the third difference is that it is non-rivalrous. You know, if I have a hunk of coal, you can't use it. But if we share data, then we all ought to be able to enjoy its benefits. And so that's what I call for in the paper is we need a competitive policy that says, let's look at the asset of the 21st century in terms of 21st century terms, rather than in terms of industrial era terms, where we seem to be struck, stuck right now. Thanks, Tom. And one, one, of, one, of the, one of the arguments I think you would hear from some of the companies is they would say, 
well, you need our massive R and D budgets, right? You 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 need us to be spending yeah. the amount of money that we're spending on R and D. So, what is what's the solution to that? Is it is it public money? Is it a different way of thinking about uh, innovation? What, what's your answer to that one? Well, yes, of course, it's public money. And one of the tragedies is that we haven't been appropriate. I'm sure I see Mike nodding his head. We haven't been appropriately funding. I mean, I talk about in the paper how the government of Shanghai spends more on non-defense artificial intelligence R&D than the entire United States government does. Okay, so we need we need to have a federal program that says, yes, we're serious. We're putting the resources here. Secondly, it's, you know, I, I talk in the paper about how the CEO of, uh, of Google says, hey, you know, we can invest and not have to expect a return for five or 10 years. Well, I was a venture capitalist for a decade before I went to the FCC. That's what VC is all about. You invest for a long-term kind of return. And you cannot make those investments, however, if what you're looking at is a market that is already tightly controlled and the future of which is tightly controlled because of the dominance of the incumbents. So if we're going to have investment, yes, we need government investment. Yes, we need private investment. And we need the basis for that private investment to, be, to have a chance that it can actually return to its risk takers. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so um, we have about 20 minutes left. I want to get to some of the great questions that have been posed to us, but I want to ask you all one more question before we do that uh, for all of you, which is, in, in the areas where, where you, you've been looking, um, what is China's um, most significant obstacle to achieving its ambition? So it's, it's kind of a straightforward question, I think, for Elsa and Scott in terms of uh, AI and biotech, respectively. Uh, but for Andrew, I think that question is kind of what challenges does China face in picking off US allies um, to engage in the kind of cooperation that you're advocating, Andrew? Um, I think for uh, Tom, um, you know, does China itself not face some of these problems with uh, anti-competitive activity with some of its large tech companies? How, how do we expect uh, China to deal with that? Um, and maybe for Mike, I think the question would be, you know, uh, what, what obstacles do you see to the broader aims of indigenization, right, that have been quite, you know, front and center for a lot of China's tech uh, ambitions? So maybe, maybe we could start with you, Mike, uh, on that one. Thanks. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, just make a comment about uh, what Tom was talking about. Uh, so my nodding head uh, indicated I, I certainly agreed with his perspective. The, and, and I think he's spot on. What you have to complement that with as we look to make the U.S. more competitive is what can we do with uh, both federal R&D uh, as well as encouraging more business R&D so that you can focus on the long term. The, the irony of uh, the venture capital example that Tom gave is you're expected to do that as a venture back company. And then as soon as you're a public company, completely the opposite. <laughs> Don't invest in right. something for the long term, but give me something that will give me a return yep. in one quarter. That's yep. not the way to be competing with China. They have a very different way of rewarding their, their companies. So I think that's important as well as the spillover effects of that federal research. When we invest in long-term research, which is best able to be done by the federal government because we have a longer time horizon. We don't have the short-term financial objectives of that. Uh, we have the benefit of creating new capabilities and even new industries. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to reward that in corporate performance when we had IBM corporate labs and Bell Labs and uh, those kind of uh, institutions in our country. Not so much these days after the shareholder revolution, but with federal R&D, we get the long-term thinking, the breakthroughs, and these spillover effects, I think China very much recognizes, uh, allow all of those uh, thousand companies that can be innovative to take that uh, benefit, that technology breakthrough, and then create uh, industries and companies around that. You've seen that with GPS and the internet spawning companies like uh, Uber and Airbnb, et cetera. So I, I think that's an important complement to, to what Tom was talking about in terms of making the U.S. more competitive for long-term. Uh, to your last question about what obstacles does China face, uh, 
Uh, they certainly face some after uh, the COVID uh, crisis, as we do, because they'll have a lot of competing priorities relative to their technology investment. So I think we're both going to be challenged to achieve our technology objectives there. They still need to catch up in some areas. Fortunately, just two examples, jet engines, where the U.S. still leads, and uh, of course, semiconductor uh, design and manufacturing capability, which are enablers for a lot of the game-changing technologies that we've talked about. So they're not quite there yet, but I think we can't rest on our laurels, so more investment required. I think that they are strong enough to have indigenous innovation now, so uh, we can't look and say that they don't have enough um, capability for the indigenous <laughs> innovation, nor can we say that they don't have a system. Uh, I hear so many people saying, well, the communist system relies on control at the top. That will never be successful. Well, the Communist Party of China has studied the lesson of history and does not have the Soviet model. They've incorporated so many of the market incentives that it's more of a decentralized model of innovation. So I think they very much uh, can compete. And that's what uh, makes me very concerned if we don't wake up and see what we need to do to compete. And lastly, from a military perspective, uh, it's not clear how well civil military fusion is going to work. Uh, of course, it's a tremendous advantage. The Defense Innovation Unit spends all day, every day, trying to encourage innovative companies to work with the Defense Department. And uh, General Secretary Xi uh, accomplished this by fiat. So we have to recognize there are some advantages to their system. I don't know how well that's going to work for them, but that certainly keeps me up at night. Thanks, Mike. Since, and since you just you ended on civil military fusion, let's go to you, Elsa, on that question. I mean, in, in your in your earlier remarks, you did mention the lack of battlefield experience. But are there are there other obstacles that you would point to, uh, particularly for the PLA in, in, in using um, AI and its weapon systems and, and other military applications? The primary obstacles are data. The military big data in particular, which is distinct from China, the data that comes out of China's commercial ecosystem and the PLA, not unlike any bureaucracy, is still struggling with how to manage, process, and best leverage that data. And additionally, talent, of course. The Chinese military has reformed its approach to recruitment, its civilian personnel system. They're trying to recruit scientists with the requisite expertise, while also trying to improve the professional military education of their officers to ensure that they have the skill sets and proficiencies to command effectively in on a much more complex battlefield in the years to come. And these, these aspects of the reforms are still very much a work in progress. And with regard to military civil fusion, I'd also add that I think, yeah, I would concur with Mike that this is certainly a competitive challenge to the US in the long term, but it's it remains a relatively nascent initiative in some respects that there, there are indicators of rapid progress on some fronts, including uh, what I've joked is a DIU with Chinese characteristics that has been set up, perhaps a compliment to the great work that DIU has been doing, uh, initially set up in Shenzhen, that's trying to, it's a very similar mandate of looking to leverage commercial technologies for military purposes. And there are some number of uh, companies in China, including startups, small and medium enterprises, even larger technology companies that have some enthusiasm for supporting military research and brand themselves as military civil fusion enterprises. A lot of uh, progress on drones, satellites, and uh, AI and space systems, as well as commercial wargaming uh, with uh, co especially computerized wargaming, which is uh, something China's really progressed uh, quite ra rapidly in, in adopting and even convening a series of national competitions with uh, piloting AI in wargaming as well. So I think, which, which is one way of uh, solving the problem of generating data and trying to anticipate battlefield dynamics lacking that op combat experience. So I think certainly uh, no shortage of challenges, but uh, I think certainly a dedicated focus on uh, re recognizing and seeking to overcome them. Thanks, Elsa. Scott, for you, I mean, if you, as you look at the development of China's biotech industry, what are, what are the indicators that you're going to be paying attention to and to kind of see whether it's been, uh, China's been able to overcome some of the obstacles that you, you do identify in the paper? Sure. Um, I think the first thing is financing. So, uh, you know, biotech is, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, there's tremendous promise and kind of frontier technologies, but they're also extremely high risk. Um, and so that combined with the fact that as in other sectors, 
it tends to be the smaller, more agile, you know, small and medium sized enterprises that are best positioned to uh, produce breakthrough uh, innovations. And yet um, China's financial system really doesn't um, uh, provide those types of, uh, of enterprises with um, good access to financing. China's financial system is much more uh, geared towards kind of the, um, the better connected um, larger enterprises. Um, so financing is a key thing. Uh, I think the second thing is kind of policy. One thing that uh, Tom brought up and I think is a, an interesting distinctive characteristic of China's innovation policy is that it really kind of empowers um, local governments to a very large uh, degree and kind of channels a lot of um, a lot of funding through local governments, also encourages local governments themselves to spend uh, quite heavily on uh, innovation policies. Um, and it's sort of what you get from that is a like build it and they will come model where a lot of times local governments will create these big sprawling, uh, you know, science parks and things like that. Um, you know, if you look at, I think, the great centers of, of S&T innovation, um, they pretty much are organic um, around the margins. I think local governments and state governments have, have done some things to encourage their growth, but it's been a pretty organic model. And I think so far it's not clear um, that that model um, really is working very well. And in fact, I think the sort of headline thing I'd, I'd say about China and the biotech industry so far is that um, China hasn't really gotten a lot of bang uh, for its buck uh, in terms of spending in the sector. Um, that could change um, depending on what happens with you know, those other two things. Uh, the third thing I would say just uh, a little bit about um, is politics. Uh, I think uh, Mike was right to kind of caution us against um, overstating the effect of authoritarian politics. It certainly um, not, you know, doesn't mean you can't innovate, doesn't mean that you, you, uh, uh, you're not innovating. Um, but uh, I think it's also a mistake to, to completely ignore it. And I think, uh, not that I think anyone on this panel has done so, but just generally speaking. Um, and I think uh, if we uh, kind of think about the, the pandemic era and the responses to it, um, the China's sort of author, you know, political pathologies, um, I think have kind of undermined um, its standing and its approach uh, to things to a, a large degree. Um, and so I think uh, going forward, um, we're gonna have to, and turn you had asked me to sort of expand a little bit perhaps on sort of dystopian visions. Um, if we think about things like regulation and control of transgenic organisms, which are combining different genetic characteristics from uh, different organisms, um, trying to regulate uh, the precursors to potential bioweapons. Um, these are all things that we are gonna need China's uh, cooperation to do. Uh, on current trends, you know, as I said, um, I don't think that's very promising. I think we're gonna have to think quite differently uh, about how to uh, persuade and perhaps compel uh, to some degree uh, China's participation in uh, multilateral initiatives like that. And I don't think the idea of compelling cooperation is as uh, much an oxymoron as it might, uh, might first sound. Thank you, Scott. Um, Tom, Tom, for you, I mean, Scott just raised the authoritarian politics. How will authoritarian politics, do you think, influence um, anti-competitive behavior by China's largest tech firms? How do, you, how do we think about the flip side of this problem that, that you uh, write about? Well, they certainly give um, great uh, advantage uh, to uh, companies and, and um, creating markets for them, uh, giving them uh, great loans. Uh, and, and the idea is go out with a um, proprietary technology that then you get the world hooked on so that the next generation has to use your technology as well and you're, and you're embedded. But let me pick up on a point that I think both Scott and, uh, and Mike have, have raised. <clears throat> Mike talked about um, this is different from Soviet command and control. Sure, sure is. They're, you know, we're not living through five-year plans uh, here. Uh, um, but I had an interesting um, experience. Uh, I was I was meeting with a bunch of Chinese uh, scholars, and we're uh, late one night in Cambridge, England. We're walking through the streets, and one of them rattles off something to me in Chinese, and I looked dumbfounded, and he translated. And and it, it apparently is a current expression over there, which is the more you try, the more you fail. Because in a hierarchical environment, um, this is where we want you to go. And if you're not going in that direction, um, uh, then, um, then you're, going, you're going to fail, which is kind of the opposite of, you know, Thomas Edison 
saying, you know, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I just succeeded in finding 10,000 things that didn't work. And, um, and I think that that remains a secret of the United States and of American entrepreneurism. And, and the question becomes, how do we take advantage of that? Um, and that's going to be one of our major policy challenges going forward, I believe. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Andrew, over to you on alliances. What, what, what challenges do you think China is going to face in picking off U.S. allies, as, as we're already seeing beginning to happen? Um, what's your prognosis? Well, that's great. I just want to quickly respond. You know, I think one of the advantages of thinking about alliances is to move beyond uh, a narrow bilateralism on a whole range of issues. So think about R&D. The U.S. and its allies comprise almost two thirds of global R&D. And there's extraordinary ways we could try to leverage that pool of research and development and coordinate on shared priorities. Same on data. You know, data advantage is a really complicated, difficult concept to measure. Uh, but thinking about this with our allies, the United States could be linking arms with allies on discrete projects and data to make up for advantages of scale, if China may have those, uh, access to larger, more diverse pools of data. We could underline the contrast on values by investments uh, in privacy preserving machine learning. Uh, and there's more we could do to invest to think about uh, going beyond uh, a data to think about systems that are less reliant on it, perhaps one shot learning or few shot learning. So just some examples of where alliances can play to our strengths. Specifically on obstacles, you know, I would say a few things. First is uh, there's a tendency for China to externalize its internal challenges. And I think at times that can result in it overplaying its hand. And we're, we're seeing that now in some of the mass diplomacy that's been occurring. Uh, the a second point I would make is something that Evan Feigenbaum and others at Carnegie have talked about, that uh, China is becoming more sophisticated in its use of economic coercive measures. And some of these are meant as wedge tactics to pry apart the United States and its allies. Uh, we've seen that in, in the Philippines, South Korea, uh, in, with Australia. Uh, but it's not clear yet that they've uh, really mastered the ladder of escalation, whether mixing more limited and stronger actions uh, together. So I think that's another obstacle. Uh, a final thing I would say is that our alliances are based not just on shared interests, but also on shared values and deep forms of connectivity. Uh, and so they're, they're in a sense harder to pry apart, though we've seen significant strains in our alliance network recently. And I think this puts a premium on the United States focusing on uh, rebuilding trust with pragmatic areas for cooperation, uh, focusing on inter interoperability, especially uh, as regards differential threat assessments. Uh, I think that can be a really difficult challenge for making sure that we're um, operating with common doctrine, common capabilities. Uh, and the final one is just, is just leadership. I think to adapt effectively, we really are going to have to uh, make sure that we're tending to our alliances, making sure that our capabilities are up to date, uh, and that we're able to adapt effectively to some of the course of measures that China is increasingly relying on. Thank you. Okay, so a, a lot, of, a lot of the questions that we got, um, uh, including uh, one from uh, Ramona Materi, uh, a number of uh, federal government analysts, was what impact will COVID COVID nineteen have on China? Do a lightning round for each of you as we wrap up here on that. Um, maybe we could start with Elsa, then Scott, Tom, Andrew, and Mike. Sure. Well, if you believe the Chinese military, they've had zero cases of COVID apparently, and that tends to provoke some skepticism, I would say. And given the Chinese military's extensive involvement in the pandemic response, especially with logistic support, the Chinese military medical establishments, uh, their work in Wuhan and beyond, I think certainly I'd expect that this will shift resources and away from other, other priorities, perhaps away from combat training for the year, though there does seem to be training exercises still underway. I think going forward, this will, all, this will really elevate the importance of biosafety, biosecurity, and biodefense, which is also a, a con concern for elements of the Chinese military that are including their support of biological and interdisciplinary technological development. So I think we, I think certainly AI will remain will will remain a priority among, among others, but I think certainly this will this will highlight the importance of looking at this more holistic understanding of security threats and challenges as well. Great, Scott. Yeah, I think um, similar to what uh, Elsa said, I think you know this is clearly um, COVID nineteen clearly calls attention to. 
uh, biosafety and biosecurity, that kind of part of the, the biomedical and biotech um, complex. Um, I think we can continue to see lots of attention paid to that. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, I think ideally and, and in principle, um, that's something that should be in the interest of all countries, but the realities of politics are that we really see, um, you know, a divergence on that and um, increasing attempts, of course, to uh, isolate China when it comes to that. Um, I have to say, though, if you kind of put politics aside, um, this is the second novel coronavirus in less than 20 years that we've seen uh, originate, at least as far as, uh, as, far as we know. Uh, in China and cause um, cause a, a significant public health uh, crisis. So I think uh, there will be uh, a lot of uh, pressure and, and need uh, to have some type of investigation uh, into uh, how um, uh, the novel coronavirus, uh, this novel coronavirus arose and, and, and how we can prevent future pandemics. That's ultimately um, what it's in everyone's interest to, uh, to try to determine. So I think that's, um, you know, that there's, there's still, it kind of accentuates the, the underlying need for cooperation and collaboration, um, but at least in the near term, uh, I think from a, sadly a, a position of pretty low trust, and I hope that we can, uh, we can restore that. Because it's noon, I just want to ask Tom, Andrew, and is there any of you who wants to come in on this before we, we, we wrap up? I would, I would say a quick point that I, I do think it underscores uh, the importance of resilience, and I think this is going to be a renewed yeah. Uh, particularly on supply chain security. Uh, we've heard in the first panel about semiconductor manufacturing equipment, uh, but this is an area again where I think uh, the United States and its allies can really think carefully uh, amid the fog of crisis about uh, what resilience might look like and what steps are gonna be needed. On that note, thank you so much. This was a great conversation, very enlightening and helping to frame the issues, but also kind of walk through um, all the levers that the United States actually does have to more effectively compete with China. Um, just as a final word, we really want to thank the Ford Foundation for their support of this project um, and the editorial team uh, and the comps team at Brookings for putting everything together here today. Um, and we hope you'll continue to stay engaged with the Global China Project, um, including some podcasts on the same series that are available on the Brookings website. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.